let's, uh, let's read God's Word. Come into His presence and worship Him today. So, uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before Him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to Him. Nothing in His appearance that we should desire Him. He was despised and rejected by man. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, He was despised and we esteemed Him not. Surely He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we consider him stricken by God, smitten by him and, afflict, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of the people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his, his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Let's pray. Father God, as we read this passage from Isaiah, we are truly humbled because we know that passage speaks of Christ. We know that passage speaks of what Jesus Christ did for us. He endured the cross. He endured the shame. He endured your wrath upon his shoulders so that we wouldn't have to. So that by his wounds we may be healed. By his righteousness we may be declared righteous. So Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, we thank you that that is the message of Good Friday and it is the message of Resurrection Sunday and it is the message that should resound in us each and every day as we consider who you are and who we are. So we praise you. So we've gathered here to worship you. We've gathered here to praise you. We've gathered here to be encouraged and to seek your glory. So meet with us, Lord, and guide us. We ask this in your name. Amen. So I would invite you to continue worshiping by singing uh, hymn number 473, uh, Victory in Jesus, hymn number 473.
How are you guys this morning? You, guys, you look tired. Are some of you tired? Everybody's tired. Why are you guys all so tired today? You need a nap, okay? <laughs> you and Tori had a double sleepover, so you're worn out. Katrina? Sleepovers are crazy. You always stay up too late, don't you? Oh, <laughs> sorry. And ran around and ran around and had so much fun and wore yourselves out. Okay. Well, hey, I'm going to talk to you guys about Easter. We did that last weekend, right? That was Easter. And what happened? What do we celebrate at Easter? We, we celebrate, what's, what's that? He rose again. He rose again. So what does that mean? He rose again. What must have happened if he rose again? What happened first? Seth, do you remember? Yeah. Jesus was nailed to the cross, and he died on the cross. And... Yeah, they did all sorts of things to him, didn't they? And then, and they whipped him, and they spit on him, and they slapped him. Doesn't sound fun, does it? No. But did, but did you? It's a lawnmower. It's a great sound. <laughs> but, do you guys know that Jesus knew that all that was going to happen? Do you know that that was his plan right from the very beginning? That in the Bible, it talks about, there's about 300, more than 300 predictions that Jesus would die on the cross for people. So it wasn't an accident. It wasn't something that just kind of happened and then God made that it wasn't a bad thing that God turned around and made good. But it was something that God planned out right from the very beginning. It says in, in Luke, and the big people we're going to look at this today, it says that Jesus took the twelve, he took his apostles, the twelve, oh yeah, you guys know who the apostles are, don't you? You got a half decent Sunday school teacher, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and <laughs> he took the twelve apostles and uh, he said to them, he's, and this is this is like before he died on the cross. He said, "We need to go to Jerusalem, and everything that's written and said by the prophets from long ago." is about to happen. I'm going to go there and I'm going to be handed over to Gentiles. See, Jewish people don't like Gentiles. They're like you and me. Yeah. They're people that are not Jewish. And Jewish people, they, they, they were God's chosen people. And they liked being God's chosen people. And they thought of themselves as pretty good. And Jesus said, I'm going to be turned over to the Gentiles. And they are going to do all sorts of things to me. They're going to mock me. They're going to insult me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to whip me. They're going to kill me. And on the third day, I'm going to rise again. So Jesus told them all that right from the very beginning. He knew about it. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says they didn't understand. They didn't know what he was talking about. But we do. We know it wasn't an accident. We know that it was because of his great love for people that he knew we needed someone to save us from our sins. So sometimes people might think that, oh, Good Friday and Easter, oh, that's not really important. Oh, that was just God, you know, making a good thing happen out of it. 
but it was all part of God's plan to save us because he loves us and he cares for us. And that's a pretty exciting thing. So I'm going to pray for you guys now. And then we're going to sing another hymn. And then you'll be able to uh, to go with Wendy and, uh, and learn some more stuff from the Bible. Because she's a really good Sunday school teacher. <laughs> Alright, let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we, we love you and we thank you. And we thank you that you planned, you made the way for us to be saved. It wasn't an accident that Jesus died on the cross. But in fact, it was all part of your plan to rescue us so that we can go. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to know that and help us to love you more. So we ask this in All right, you guys can go back. And then everyone else, we can all uh, stand up. And uh, we're going to sing our next hymn of praise. And our next hymn of praise is hymn number 186, The Old Rugged Cross. So hymn 186.
So let's uh, let's turn to Luke chapter 18, and uh, we're going to be looking at uh, verses 31 through 34. And uh, as I mentioned to the kids, and uh, I want to mention it now to us uh, again, because it, sometimes we it's not always clear. It's not clear to the people in the world. It's not even clear to Christians, because a lot of times Christians can believe that God isn't really in control of all things. A lot of times Christians can think that, you know what, God uses bad circumstances for His good. That God will take something bad and He will manipulate it so something good comes of it. And to, to a certain degree, I, I don't want to argue with you about that. But what we need to understand is that the cross is not one of those situations. That Jesus going and dying on the cross isn't God adjusting on the fly and being uh, flexible and changing his plan. Jesus knew right from the very beginning what the plan of redemption was. Because it's his plan. It's not Satan doing something thinking he won. It has always been Christ's plan to redeem us from sin through his sacrifice on the cross. Jesus predicted his death multiple times while he was here on earth. The first time he predicted his death was in Luke 9. And he had just fed the multitudes. He fed the, the multitude of people. And Jesus said, the Son of Man must suffer many things. He's going to be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the, and the scribes. And he will be killed and then he will rise again. That's when Peter harshly rebuked Jesus. And Christ responded by saying, get behind me, Satan. Jesus knew his death must happen, and it was necessary in God's plan to save the world. The second time in Luke, when he, he made this uh, prediction, was in Luke 9, and it was shortly after the transfiguration, when Peter, James, and John saw Christ in his heavenly glory. And uh, perhaps this was the reason why the disciples were so confused by Jesus telling them he was going to die. And at that, at that point, they believed his kingdom was right around the corner. But despite of their lack of understanding, they were afraid to ask for clarification. The third time is here in Luke, verse, or chapter 18, when Jesus again predicts his death. He was heading towards Jerusalem for the Passover. And he told them how he was going to be mocked and scourged and crucified and then rise again. And on this time, the disciples still didn't understand what Jesus was saying. The meaning was hidden to them. But at least on three accounts, and we'll get into more as we go through, Jesus revealed that he would die. So this is the passage that we pick up on. He's on his final journey to Jerusalem. He's making this prediction about his death. Now this sermon that I have worked on, it, it could have been our Good Friday service. In some ways it could have been our, it could have been our Palm Sunday service. It could have been Good Friday. It could have been Easter. But I really felt led to, to do this today after so that as we look back on what we just celebrated, we can even be reminded again that it wasn't an accident as to why Christ went and died on the cross. So here is God's word. Luke chapter 18, 
starting at verse 31. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they didn't grasp what was said. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. In fact, he was only a few days from arriving in Jerusalem. And the closer he got to Jerusalem, the clearer Jesus became on the purpose of going. And I remember growing up in the Catholic Church, and we don't, we don't speak of it a whole lot in, in Baptist circles, but the week leading into Easter has a name for it that I never understood as a kid. Do you guys know the name of it? It's called The Passion Week. And uh, even like Mel Gibson named that movie after it, The Passion. And I often wonder, why? Why Passion? Why do we refer to this week as Jesus' passion? And when we think of passion, we kind of refer to it as an emotion that is deeply stirring, such as love or a desire. That's our modern meaning of the word. However, the root word in Latin of passion means suffering. So understood in this sense, we know why. It's called the passion, we understand. Even to a certain extent with our own translation of passion, of, of desire, of love, we can understand it, but it gives a bit more of a deeper meaning. Jesus wanted his followers to understand the suffering that was going to come. He wanted us to know and he wanted the people to know his his, his uh, apostles, his disciples that were following, that it wasn't an accident. They didn't get it at the time. But as they look back, I'm sure it became more clear. This whole chapter in Luke, we've been reading about how Jesus has been teaching about the entry, how you can enter into the kingdom of God. He wanted people to understand that if you needed or if you wanted to enter the kingdom and have eternal life, you needed to depend on the mercy of God. That there is nothing you can do to gain entrance on your own. Isaiah 64 says, All our righteous deeds are like a polluted or a dirty garment. And there is nothing that anyone can do to make us righteous or acceptable in God's eyes. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've all turned our way. And that we can't do it. Luke 19 says that that's why God sent Jesus. To seek and to save the lost. So that's why he's come. That's what he's doing here. He's teaching the disciples. He's teaching the Pharisees. He's teaching everybody around him what it means to be able to enter the kingdom of God and how to do it. We even saw how he told the rich young ruler that you have to repent. Because the rich young, young ruler, remember a couple weeks ago or last week, came up and said, I have kept all of the commands since I was young. I'm doing a good job. And Jesus went through some of them and he pat the, the rich young ruler patted himself on the back. But then Jesus said to him, well, what you need to do is you need to go and sell everything you have. Because he knew the rich young ruler placed his love of money, his love of uh, worldly goods, over his love of God. So he was saying you need to repent of your love of the world in order to gain entrance into the kingdom of God. And then he assured, I love this, and I didn't touch on it a lot last week, but he assured 
Peter and the rest of the disciples. Because remember, they said, how is it that can anybody gain entrance into heaven if even the rich can't do it? And they said, what about us? We've given up everything. And Jesus looked at them and said, because you have given up everything, because you have loved me first, Yours is the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> so that's where we're at. The days are drawing near for Jesus to go to Jerusalem. He's been teaching his disciples why he's going, what he's going to be doing, and how they too can enter in to the kingdom of God. So while on his way to Jerusalem, he said in verse 31 of 18, everything that is written about the Son of Man is about to be accomplished. Everything that the prophets said long ago is about to happen. It's about to be made clear. <clears throat> The Son of Man. Have you guys ever pondered that usage of Jesus before? Why does he call himself the Son of Man? This paints a, a good picture for us of who Jesus really is. That title, the Son of Man, is a title of humanity. It gives us the picture, it gives us the understanding that even though Jesus Christ is fully God, He is also fully man. It shows us that He humbled Himself. He took on mankind's likeness. He left heaven's glory and took on human flesh. And He humbled Himself. It's an interesting thought for us to remember about this, about what he's done. The Son of Man also gives us a title or a, uh, of his deity as well. When we remember that all the fullness of God lives in bodily form in Jesus Christ, that's from Colossians. We see that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man in this title. But Jesus also calls himself, he gives himself this title because he's referring back to Daniel chapter 7. So if you've got your Bibles, just, just flip back there really quick because Jesus is painting a picture of something that Daniel saw. And it's Daniel 7 verses 13 and 14. And if you want, you know, stick your pen in there for later. You can read the entire verse or the entire chapter. But Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Daniel saw glory, worship, and an everlasting kingdom given to the Messiah, who was called the Son of Man. Jesus is applying this prophecy to himself. He is showing that I am that man, that part of the Godhead who is coming down to redeem my kingdom. This is huge for us to understand that it's not an accident. Jesus understood that he was the one whom the Father would give the eternal kingdom to. 
And that is why he was referring to himself as the Son of Man. That's important for us to know. We also should note that Jesus was going to Jerusalem so that everything that was written about him by the prophets would be accomplished. Jesus wasn't a well-intended victim of a plan that surprised him when it went horribly wrong. He knew exactly how his life would end, down to the smallest detail. And he had known it since the beginning of the world, when the plan of salvation was formed. The heart of the Christian faith is the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything in the history of redemption in the Old Testament moves towards the cross. And everything that has happened since moves from the cross. The cross is the tipping point in history. It is the most pivotal event that has ever happened. Do we treat it like that? Do we love that? Do we know that it wasn't an accident? I shared at the beginning three times where Jesus had already predicted that he would die on the cross. There's at least three more times in the book of Luke that we've already covered where Jesus predicted his death. In chapter 12, verses 49 to 50, Jesus said, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and a <coughs> constant restraint I am until it is completed. In Luke 13, he said, at that same time, Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. And Jesus said, go tell that fox I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on and today and tomorrow and the next, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Luke 17, for the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to another. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Jesus was clear. The cross was always part of his plan. It wasn't an accident. So as Christians, we need to love that, know that, trust that. It's not an accident. His death happened for a reason. And so today, Greg, I challenge you last week, do we know what that reason is? It was so that he could take our sins and pay the price. I love how clear Jesus was on what was going to happen these verses, he was so clear. We read through it very quickly sometimes, not even paying attention to how much detail Jesus gave about his upcoming crucifixion. The first half of verse 32, Jesus said that he would be delivered over to the Gentiles. Like that's pretty shocking that a Jewish guy is going to get delivered over to the Gentiles. This prediction was fulfilled after Jesus was arrested. The Jewish council handed him over to Pilate, Pontius Pilate, who was a Roman governor. He was a Gentile, and he was hand, Jesus Christ was handed over to him. So we see Jesus knew that. We also see that Jesus knew that he would be mocked. Verse, the, sec, the next part of verse 32, it says, and he will be mocked. This was fulfilled in Luke 22 when it says, now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. Later on in chapter 23, Herod and his soldiers 
treated him with contempt and mocked him. And then in Luke 23, 36, we see the soldiers also mocked him. Jesus knew what was coming, what awaited him. The next part in verse 32, it says, they shamefully treated him. We're going, it says that he would be shamefully treated. Everything that Christ went through was shameful. But if you flip in your Bible to Matthew 26, we see where someone went up and slapped him. That is shameful. Jesus says that he would be spit upon. We know that that happened. And in Matthew 27, it says, And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. Continuing in our reading today, it said they would flog him. We know that Pontius Pilate had Christ flogged. We know in verse 33, it says that he would be killed. We know Christ died. But we also know, as the next part of verse 32 says, that he will be handed over to the Gentiles, they will mock him, they will insult him, they will spit on him, they will flog him, they will kill him. And then the most wonderful thing is, on the third day, he will rise again. He knew all of that, yet he still did it for us. He endured the cross. It wasn't by mistake. It was because we needed it. It was because He loves us. And it was because it was His plan and nobody else's. And astonishingly, the disciples, the apostles, they didn't understand it. They understood none of these things because it was hidden from them and they couldn't grasp what was going on. They failed to recognize Christ for who He truly is because they had misunderstandings. They didn't understand that their Messiah was going to be a suffering Messiah. They believed that he was going to be a conquering Messiah. This is why I said this could have been a Palm Sunday service message. Because they believed that the Messiah would come as the conquering hero. They had a whole different picture of what Christ was supposed to be. It wasn't until his death and his resurrection that they fully understood. So the question I have for myself and for you is do you have expectations about how Jesus is supposed to work today? Did you expect that when you became a follower of Jesus that all of your problems would suddenly vanish? Did you expect that if you prayed for your unsaved loved one, that he or she would immediately become saved? Do you expect that if you read your Bible and say your prayers, that God would answer every one of your prayers the way you want them answered? Do you expect that if you give your money to the church, that God will bless you with an abundance of cash? Just plant the seed. We often misunderstand the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And then we wonder why we struggle so much. The apostles had that problem. They had the Old Testament. They had Jesus in flesh and blood right there, and they still missed the point. The only way to grow in a correct understanding of who Jesus is, is the careful work and study of His word and of prayer and of encouraging each other. 
Do we do that? Or do we neglect it? Do we think we know who Jesus is and say, I don't need to read my Bible. I've been a Christian. Well, I've been a Christian for 20 years. I know who Jesus is. I've got him all figured out. Think back to when you were a new believer. The hunger you had. Man, when I when I was in between grade 8 and grade 9, and I came to the understanding of who Christ was, I couldn't get enough of my Bible. I was reading it all the time because it, it was amazing that Christ died for me. It was amazing all of the things that the Bible spoke to that were true. And I couldn't get enough of it. And I read it regularly because I wanted to know who this Jesus was that died on the cross for me. Now sometimes it's really embarrassing for me because I would rather spend an extra 20 minutes in my nice, warm, cozy bed on a cool winter's morning instead of getting up and spending time with God. For those of you who are married, what would you say to your spouse if they said, come and have coffee with me? And you all the time said, no, I'd rather stay in bed. Or no, I'd rather watch the Leafs lose again. <laughs> or no. <laughs> Let's stick on that one. What's more beneficial? Watching the Leafs lose again and breaking your heart? Or spending time with the one who broke his body so that your hearts could be healed and saved? How messed up are our priorities? Even when the Blue Jays win the World Series this year, and John and I are going to be rejoicing, that will pale in comparison to the joy of heaven and knowing and seeing God face to face. Think of what Christ went through willingly to rescue us from our sin and from eternal damnation. Do we know who Christ is? Or have we made an idol, made a false god in our image of who we want Jesus to be, of who we desire Him to be. I used to play chess, and uh, chess is a rather interesting game because the whole purpose of the game is to protect the king and move all the other pieces around and sacrifice all of them so that the king can live. But once your king dies, you lose and the game is over. If you watch movies, you all in these, you know, those war type of movies, the they always have, you know, when the battle comes, they've always got the soldiers up first and then the generals. And way back up on the hill is where the king always leads from in safety and protection. And everybody else is supposed to sacrifice themselves so that the king can live. That's not what Jesus did, is it? He did the exact opposite thing. He went to the front of the line. He stepped forward and said, I will die in the place of Dennis 
so that Dennis can have eternal life. So that Dennis doesn't have to experience the death because of his sins. The cross, Jesus' death, and resurrection changes everything. Because of that, we now have a hope and a purpose and a reason to live. As Christians, that is our story. This is our song. This is what we should be sharing all the day long. But instead, we forget. We forget the passion of Christ to set us free. So that's why I thought today, you know, yeah, Easter, Christmas, or Easter. Easter and, uh, and Good Friday, they're in the rearview mirror. We don't have to think about that anymore. But in fact, we should think about that every day. So we're going to sing our final hymn. Our final hymn of praise is hymn number 213, and it is Because He Lives. And because He lives, we can face Because He lives, all fear is gone. And that is a wonderful, joyful thing for us to proclaim up today. So hymn number 213.
grace to shine upon you. And may you experience his peace, knowing that he is in control and that he has a plan. He is working it through in all things. Let's go rejoicing in